and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. We are about four issues-ish away from the end of Nintendo Power's third year. Um, as we get started with, with Nintendo Power number 21 for February of 1991. Let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Star Tropics. The cover is a collage instead of the usual dioramas, and I think it looks great. The piano keys on the bottom of the picture seem a little out of place, particularly since I don't recall any puzzles involving piano keys in the game. Our letters column this issue has two letters discussing the durability of Nintendo products. One is about a Game Boy that got accidentally chucked through the window of a car when the driver slammed on the brakes, and the other is about an NES which accidentally got a hole punched through the top of the control deck due to a truck that had been improperly packed by the user by the uh, movers. Both of them work just fine after these relevant inter relevant accidents. I'm really impressed by this. It's kind of impressive generally by how the game the that's again just the Game Boy hardware, but the Nintendo hardware in general basically seems to pretty much keep a licking take a licking and keep on ticking. More or less. We, people who've owned original NES, the uh, control deck, front loader units, know that the contacts do run into a lot of problems later on. But, anywho, we'll, we'll get into that when they do the uh, new top loader in a few in magazine years. Our first game of the issue is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game, which in case you couldn't guess, is a port of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game, which was basically rocking arcades until arcades started seriously dying. Like, really, when I was in, um, like, fourth or fifth grade, I went to a, Chuck e. Cheese, a birthday party at a Chuck E. Cheese, and they still had a TMNT four-player arcade machine there. I think this was back when, um, this would have been about three or four years after this issue came out. Um, anyway, we get a rundown of the characters and their moves, along with maps of most of the game, if not all. The maps are rather interesting, as unlike some of the brawlers we've reviewed previously, we get information on where enemies spawn in the level and how many of them spawn. We also get some information on how many HP each type of enemy and the bosses have. This is particularly important because the number of sort of generic mooks that spawn and the amount of hit points that bosses have appears to increase by about one and two thirds if you're playing the game two player. Fortunately, if this is causing problems for you, the article also gives you a code for ten lives and if you pull that off, it should make up for the increased difficulty somewhat. Now, TMNT2 is really the next step in the evolution of the brawler. Adding a designated jump button and special moves, which I found a little difficult to pull off, but some people don't have this problem, um, takes things a little closer to the brawlers of the 16-bit generation, like Final Fight, Golden Axe, and Streets of Rage. In particular, not just the designated jump button, but also the way the sort of level layout is done, where it's got a sort of prof sort of slope, visual slope to it, to give a sense of depth that's not quite as dramatic as the visual slope that we see in games like, for example, Renegade. So it's a narrow, it's a it's described as a narrower strip than Runaway, than um, Renegade's sort of basketball court or what have you. Um, but it has more depth to it than, say, Double Dragon did. Um, that said, this game is not without its problems. I'm not a fan of how the game is set up to be more difficult if you're playing the game in two-player. Mainly because one of the advantages of playing the, the game in two-player is for example, a more productive player or a more skilled player can carry someone who is less experienced with the game. So that way, if you go to your friend and say, Hey, I just got TMNT2, 
I've been playing it for a while, it's great, we should play it together, you're not penalized by bringing your inexperienced friend in. Um, now, it'd be one thing if the... if there was an optional setting to have extra enemies and extra hit points, so a sort of hardcore mo mode to play, or hardcore mode or something like that. Um, but it's not. I'm not saying this game isn't worth playing. It's really... It, it's fun. And it's also really not that hard to get a hold of. Um, you could probably, at any um, independent video game store that sells NES games, find a copy of this for about five bucks-ish, depending on your region. Um, and at that price, and with the quality of the game, there's going to be a reason not to pick this game up. However, it's also one of the games where if you have difficulty entering that 10 lives code in consistently, it might be worth playing with, say, oh, a Game Genie and using a equivalent code on that. Next up is Howard and Nestor, and in this issue, um, our merry band is playing Mega Man 3, and they end up facing robot duplicates of Mega Man, or, er, uh, Nestor. I'll note that Nestor, at least, is has fallen for Dr. Wily's line, so somebody, albeit a fictional character who isn't part of the Mega Man universe, did does fall for the whole, oh, Dr. Wily's reformed, oh, it's not Wily, it's someone else, shtick. Next up is the cyberpunk action game, or semi-cyberpunk action game, Quantum Fighter Kabuki, or Kabuki Quantum Fighter. Get information on the weapons you get over the course of the game, with one new weapon per level. There's also maps through about level 5 of the game. Now, Quantum Fighter Kabuki, or the other way around, depending on who you ask, is a pretty interesting game. The player controls a U.S. military officer who goes into a computer system to fight, to fight off an AI virus that is threatening to take control of America's nuclear arsenal. However, the avatar the officer takes when he enters the system is that of a Kabuki performer. The controls of the game are very good. Jumping is responsive, and depending on how long you hold the jump button, you get different lengths of jumps, like with Super Mario Bros. However, like Mega Man, your jump is not floaty, it's fairly fast and very responsive. And so once you figure out how far holding down the jump button will get you through a little basic experimentation, you can get some very precise jumps. It's great. Game weapons are also interesting. Uh, aside from your basic attack, attack, which is the hair whip, um, you also get various weapon upgrades which are powered by chips as you go through the game, starting off with a single basic blaster and moving on to a advanced blaster and then a spread shot and so forth and so on as we go through the game. This means that rather than having you picking up power-ups and having to hold on to the one power-up that works best for you throughout the whole game, you get a variety of options, and your basically your weapon tool set improves as you make your way through the game. Uh, sort of like, I guess, we, as a form of difficulty, for lack of a better term, um, bal balancing or what have you, where the game gets harder, but your weapons will always be getting better as the game gets harder. Um, this is definitely one of those games where, when I was reading Nintendo Power back in the day at the at my local library, I heard about this game, but I didn't hear anyone talking about this game outside of like Nintendo Power. I didn't have my friends at school talking about it. I generally don't see many um, reviewers talking about it, at least not the big name ones. I mean, they may have done reviews of it back in the day, but it's not something that gets constant discussion or that sort of thing. Um, and looking on eBay, just a cartridge of this runs about ten bucks, which is a pretty good price for um, a game of this caliber. I'd say it's definitely worth checking out. Our classified information column this issue is kind of combining the Game Boy and the NES coverage here, where we have one Game Boy game making its way in here. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Fall of the Foot Clan. Um, for the Game Boy, has some tips about how to get the various bonus stages. Additionally, we have also some tips for the Immortal, in the form of information on how to find an interesting Easter egg, that also helps you get through some enemies. If you um, get a 
pot of coffee on level five of the dungeon. You can take it to some programmers, yes, programmers, on level six, who will give you an item that will take out basically two trolls for you in more or less the next room. I find it kind of a nice little Easter egg, and I'm glad that they're sort of calling it out here. I, I kind of enjoy it a little bit when a game kind of breaks the fourth wall in a few way in some way, ways. Next is Star Tropics, Nintendo of Amer Nintendo's sort of U.S. exclusive game. Um, it's a, for lack of a better description, Zelda-style adventure game. It's more linear than Zelda is, um, with set areas and really only one dungeon per, er per area, so it's less a matter of um, exploring the, the world and trying to figure out which order you're kind of supposed to do the dungeons in, and more just finding the dungeon on each level and then clearing it. Um, we get information on the first two dungeons of the game and the over associated overworld areas, and later in the issue we basically get informed that next issue we'll be getting, like, about the next four or five dungeons, so I'm going to hold off on reviewing this game until then. That said, I am a little annoyed by the fact that the editors made this game the featured title in this issue of the magazine and then saved the lion's share of the content for next issue. I mean, it's your cover game. It should be your more heavily featured game. Gremlins 2 has now also gotten an adaptation for the Game Boy. This time, instead of being a somewhat top-down shooter platformer, it's now just a plat platformer of the side-scrolling variety. We have maps of the first th first two stages of the game, with a particular focus on giving the reader a very specific route through the level, which seems a little odd. Gremlins 2 has a lot has the problems that a lot of games of the side-scrolling platformer variety have when their main character's primary attack is melee. The main attack has no reach. The NES Gremlins game dealt with this problem by not giving Gizmo a melee attack at all. You had ranged attacks with basically unlimited ammo. Um, now, they kind of compensated with this by, when you hadn't upgraded your weapons yet, giving your attacks a limited range. Other games which have melee weapons or melee focused attacks have also kind of compensated for this and are successful in adapting this by giving the main characters attack with some sort of reach, whether it's um, Seven Belmont's Whip or the swords of characters like Leonardo from Ninja Turtles or Strider Hiryu or that sort of thing. Gizmo in this game has no reach. He's attacking with a pencil and he has no reach with it at all. Um, and there's really no reason for that. I understand he's not a warrior, but he could kind of use it like a use the pencil like a spear, thrusting it forwards rather than kind of swinging it down like a bat, which, considering he's swinging with the pointy end, doesn't make any sense. You don't bonk them with the pointy end, as anyone who's seen Game of Thrones would tell you. You stick them with the pointy end. Um... Instead, it looks like he's swatting flies with a hat. It gets rid of a hat. It's a... I get a pencil. Um, additionally, while the game gives you some ranged attacks, you can't store them. You get one shot with them, and then you lose it. And you can't, like, hang on to that one shot for later. And in turn, the game is also really good at tossing enemies at you right after you get your ranged attack, so... Basically, you end up wasting it, because ideally what you should be doing is saving the ranged attack for an enemy who can be more easily taken out with a ranged attack, like one of the other, um... I forget, oh, one, of the other one of the grandmas. Um, or Magua. But instead, what happens is... Well, you end up wasting it on some stupid bat, and having to use your weak sauce melee weapon to take out the enemy, to the more difficult enemy. Um, considering how good the NES version of Gremlins 2 was, 
The fact this version is so poor seems like a disappointment, a really significant disappointment. Honestly, I'd recommend getting the NES version of this game instead of the Game Boy version. Next up is a collection of notes on various Game Boy basketball titles titled Round Ball Roundup. Considering that baseball and soccer, and for that matter, bowling and tennis all have round balls, I'd think those sports would get featured as well. As it is, we have two one-on-one -on -one basketball games featured here. LJN's All-Star Challenge, and Jellico's In Your Face, and then Konami's handheld port of Double Dribble 5 on 5, which is a port of the NES version. Now, I've already gone on record saying I don't like video game basketball games, and I dislike one-on-one -on -one basketball games even more, because balancing the AI into something where it doesn't curb stomp you, or alternatively isn't a cakewalk, is something that either, I guess, either too difficult for the programmers to pull off properly, or something where the programmers didn't necessarily care enough to put in the work. Consequently, and this isn't something I don't do often, and I'll be doing it one more time this issue, I am skipping all of these. I'm just going to give a straight-up recommendation not to buy them. Also, we get a Game Boy-specific classified information column, so those haven't been completely integrated yet. Um... We have a few tips here, just a smattering, nothing really catches my attention as anything notable. Next up is Magician for the NES, a sort of Zelda 2 styled RPG with a system where you craft your own spells using a rune system and you get the formula by buying spell scrolls from stores. We get level maps and advice on how to get through the first few levels of the game. Now, if you want to know what it's like to play Magician, Imagine playing a game in the Elder Scrolls series as a spellcaster, with a mod installed so that your character has hunger and thirst and you have to eat food and drink water to stay alive. Now imagine playing this hypothetical game in the Elder Scrolls series, completely cold, never having played it before, not having a chance to experiment with the magic system or that sort of thing, and no real knowledge of the magic system from earlier games. Magician is kind of like that, except we're not in the first person, so the game is less immersive, and the magic isn't as broken in the player's favor as it is in, say, Morrowind or Oblivion. Additionally, the game has a sort of bizarre hard limit on the number of saves you can make per game, specifically 15. You can have multiple save, slot save slots, allowing for a certain degree of saves coming, but still, the hard limit is an unnecessary game design decision for me. Or in addition, a horror game like Resident Evil, set in a confined and claustrophobic place, like the mansion from the first Resident Evil game, I say the limits of um, the number of saves are kind of acceptable. It makes saving your game a resource you need to manage, like ammunition for your guns. However, this isn't a horror game, this is a fantasy RPG. Putting a limit on the number of saves, particularly for a game that can run as long as this one can, serves no purpose. Additionally, some of the spells seem weirdly kind of weak sauce in terms of it's difficult to tell what spell you're supposed to be using on what opponent and also hard to tell when a spell is actually being effective. If you're going to play this game, either play it on an emulator or play it on the Retro 5 as that game has save states and that way you don't have to worry about the really stupid arbitrary save system. Next is a more informative article, with Nintendo Power talking about the magazine's game rating system. Now, I don't I haven't discussed the ratings they give games in the past, and, well, because in part they haven't really discussed their rating system until now. And additionally, honestly, they're, it's not really a useful rating system in terms of judging one game in this magazine against another game. The... I mean, any game that's going to get a really poor rating isn't going to get featured in the magazine. Um, the, and as ultimately, this magazine is meant to be a vehicle for the Nintendo Entertainment System and the games for the system because Nintendo wants people to buy Nintendo games so they can make money off of the licensing fees for those games. Consequently, featuring really terrible games doesn't help them or at least giving scores next to really terrible games 
doesn't help them. For example, one of the games they mentioned in here that got really terrible scores was LJN's Major League Baseball, which is a game I panned when I reviewed it a while back. And when they ran that um, that game sort of feature thing as part of a multi um, sort of profile of baseball games, they didn't give a score for it. Similarly, earlier in this issue, when we had the round ball roundup, none of the sports games there particularly had scores given. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing where if they don't like a game, they're not going to feature it in the magazine or not display its score. If they do like a game or it did get a good score, that will get, then it'll have its score listed. So as a sort of yardstick for telling whether a game is something you should buy or not, in this magazine, this score system is useless. Now, in another magazine, if one that's willing to, that's reviewing every game and using the whole range of the scale, like, for example, Electronic Gaming Monthly, or later issues of GamePro, this score, uh, this scale would actually be useful. And who knows, maybe at some point in the future I'll do a similar retrospective on GamePro and we'll talk about the evolution of that magazine scoring system. Ultima 4, the most famous game in the Ultima series, has now gotten ported to the NES. Uh, under the title of Ultima Quest of the Avatar. In the article, we get a map of Britannia, as well as info on the eight virtues you must nurture, along with the treasures you must need to find, in, uh, whether you need to find into the game's dungeon. Now, normally, I put the focus on the NES version of a game that I'm reviewing, if it's a port, and I review all the featured games, and this game is certainly featured. However, Ultima 4 is, as of this recording, available for free, for Windows and Mac gaming systems, and as it's being run in DOSBox, probably available for Linux as well, on GOG.com. It's been available in that form for several years. Um, it's will run. It'll run on basically almost any system. If you're still running Windows XP right now, it'll run on your computer just fine. Um, frankly. I, frankly, the NES version of this game has been gutted. Um, it tries to do a lot of what the game, what the uh, PC version tried to do. However, it's a situation where, just from the memory restrictions of the NES, combined with sort of the, the input problems you run into with the, um, with dealing with the controller, um, and also Nintendo of America's own censorship policies, this game is not going... It's going to be a shadow of the of the PC version in a way that Ultima Exodus wasn't. Um, I compare this to trying to watch Kingdom of Heaven on broadcast television. They're going to show the theatrical cut because it's shorter and they have time constraints to deal with. They have other programming to show, too. And they're going to cut down the movie to make it fit within the criteria for a PG or, at best, a PG-13 rating. Consequently, the amount of stuff cut from the original that for, for that release on t broadcast television makes the film actually not worth the time that you'd spend sitting down and watching it on television. You'd be better off going to the library or renting it from Netflix, or if you still have video stores in your area, getting it that way, or even, for that matter, watching it on HBO, waiting for, if you have HBO or Showtime, watching it through there, because they'll probably show the director's cut at some point there. In the same sense, you can get this game in its original intended form, legally for free. There is no reason not to get this game in that form. So get it that way. I will have a link to Ultima 4 on GOG in the show notes. Next up is Counselor's Corner, and we got a lot of hints here for Maniac Mansion, and even more as sort of greatest hits of the hints for The Legend of Zelda. Next we have our Players Poll Contest, and normally I don't discuss these, but this one has subject matter near and dear to my heart. 
as a tabletop gamer. So the winner of this issue's Players Poll Contest gets a trip to Chicago and the Battletech Center and an opportunity to pilot one of the Battletech simulators in there. Even more, the second place winners get a copy of the Battletech game, along with several of the expansions, a novel, and an assortment of patches, presumably one for each of the houses of the Inner Sphere. This is really awesome, and I kind of want to go back in time and enter in the Players' Poll Contest so I can get to do this, because this is, of all of these contests they've run here, this is the one that I really want to do. Um, even more than their sort of Final Fantasy um, go on a quest contest thing. This is extraordinary. So we have the now playing column next, and Skate or Die is getting a winter-themed spinoff with Ski or Die. Now, while the game has snowboarding as one of the events, it's not exactly the focus of the game that skateboarding was with Skate or Die. Considering that we're getting into the uh, 90s, you'd think snowboarding would have more of the focus. I mean, by this point, we've already seen James Bond snowboard in A View to a Kill. So, next is our top 30, and I missed this column last issue, for which I apologize. And this issue, TMNT2 and Dr. Mario have entered the top 10. Next is our celebrity profile, and we have interviews this issue with two players from the L.A. Lakers. And I'm going to mangle his first name. Vlade Divac, from what is now Serbia, and his teammate A.C. Green. Divac's career, since he has left the Lakers, has done quite well. He is currently president of the Serbian Olympic Committee. Um, while A.C. Green, not so much. Um, some gurg- while some Googling reveals that he's from Portland and went to Benson, which is kind of cool, um, he has, since his retirement from basketball, founded two multi-level marketing companies. One which sells financial planning services, and the other selling a pseudoscientific cure for back pain. Wonderful. In Pack Watch, um, JVC is working on a Star Wars game with LucasArts. Hudson has a new Adventure Island game on the way, and Acclaim is putting out Double Dragon 3. Wrapping things up this issue, in the Super Famicom Showcase, we get a look at another title that's coming out for the Super Nintendo. The Super Nintendo version of Sim City. We also get to mention in the article that the NES version is on the way, but that game never got officially released. However, a little research has shown that someone has found a prototype of the NES version, and I suspect that there's probably also a ROM dump out there of the file. So... I may have to hunt down the ROM, it's available through an emulator site, and see if I can check it out some point in the future. Maybe do a special um, end of the NES Life sort of episode of the games that got featured in Nintendo Power, but which never actually came out. Something like that. This issue, we only have one game with two-player, and I'm only really reviewing one Game Boy game, so we only have one pick this week. And so, I'm going to go with Kabuki Quantum Fighter, or Quantum Fighter Kabuki, whichever you prefer, for my pick of the issue. It's really a game that does everything I want in an action platformer. It has very good jumping controls, it has good attacks. Um, I like the sort of level-by-level weapon progression. The power-up system is nice, but how they do it here is interesting. Um, So, that's kind of definitely what I'm going for. Um, As far as Star Tropics goes, again, that's going to be reviewed next issue. Um, So, it's going to be up for contention there. And so, look forward to that. Also, next issue, we're going to have a look at Metal Storm. If you enjoyed the show, please hit the like button. And subscribe to the channel, so next time one of these comes out, you'll get notified. Additionally, if you want to support the show uh, financially, uh, there's a link in the show notes to my Patreon page where you can donate. This will help me get shows out more regularly, and in turn, help me get um, better equipment. Also, there's a link up here as well. 
Um, if you want to prefer to click that one, they both go to the same place. And do help me improve my recording equipment, help me, help me get these videos out more regularly, and if you also enjoy watching my other shows outside of the Nintendo Power Retrospective, you may have an opportunity to choose the topics and do other interesting bits. So, until next time, thank you very much for watching.